Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ARM with Steve Roddy, who's going to talk today about making sense out of machine learning performance metrics. Steve, there's a lot of confusing information out there regarding metrics. What makes sense? What do people have to think about? It's a real challenging problem for people to decide what type of IP to buy to put in a chip or what type of chip to put in their system based on the metrics that the vendors are giving because they're very abstract and very simplistic. What, what the user really wants is how well will my workload work in this system? That's very dependent on the source network you started with, your training data, your particular use model. And something very simplistic like TOPS is very hard to use as a, as a metric to judge solutions A, B, C. Do you always know when you're building these devices how it's going to be used? No, that's actually one of the very big challenges in our, in our ecosystem in the way the, the electronics industry works. You've got a tremendous disaggregation between the algorithm owner or the data scientist. Notice we say scientist, not engineer. Below that might be the data engineer or the embedded programmer targeting and tailing, tailoring an algorithm to a particular device. You've got the box builder, you've got the, the chip company, and so you've got many different layers, and they often can't share the data or the model directly between them if they're in different companies because the proprietary nature of a model might be something that the algorithm owner doesn't want to, to give away, so now the chip integrator has to make a decision based on some abstract metric like reference inferences per second with, uh, with a ResNet or a mobile net or something even simpler like TOPS. Let's drill down into this. Sure. So Steve, what are we looking at here? All right, so every uh, inferencing engine, typically people use names like NPU, but you could even talk about the capabilities of CPUs or DSPs or GPUs. Everything starts with a, a raw metric of how many multipliers do you have that can operate on any given clock cycle? Your number of 8-bit multiplies typically is the metric times the frequency times how many do you have. So the raw metric of TOPS or teraops per second is simply a measure of at its peak in one clock cycle how much work gets done and usually it's something on the order of one or two teraops, so that's 500, 12, or 1,024 multipliers operating s simultaneously in parallel. This is sort of the equivalent of buying a 500 horsepower engine when you're stuck on a road that can only, you can only go 40 miles an hour, right? That's actually a, a very good analogy because how much actual work you get over a useful period of time is what really the, the end user cares about. So if you're fitting uh, an algorithm, your particular uh, inferencing model for identifying people or identifying faces to unlock a front door or security system, etc. You care about actual work accomplished. You don't care about what's the, the peak uh, you know, horsepower output of that engine in that car because you don't normally drive you know, 180 miles an hour uh, on the freeway. You have to drive within traffic and have to handle all the other systems. But you're also dealing with an, a technology that's continuing to evolve and change as we go forward. So how do you make those choices up front? So the, the, so the raw tops is a very good metric for peak performance. And that's useful to know at its worst, you, what does your algorithm need to keep up with total data rates? But more importantly, it's effective uh, average utilization of that engine that makes the most sense. So if this engine you know, could do let's say two tops peak, but most of the time it's stuck idling at only 10% utilization because it's starved for data getting in and out of the system. It's like having that, uh, that sports car that you know, has a big V12 engine, but you somehow are feeding it fuel through a, a small paper straw that's leaking. So how do you choose what's representative of your workload? So the perfect answer would be you get to t target and tailor your particular workload to the given chip or the given architecture if you're, if you're designing silicon. That's a lot of work that means quantizing and training and reducing a network to fit. So that's oftentimes not really feasible. What's typically done is, is picking some sort of representative workload. You think you're doing something that's voice and speech recognition, let's pick something like waved a letter that's representative of what you're gonna do. And then look at the performance of the silicon or IP from the various vendors based on those representative workloads. 
There's a lot of variation in here, though, too, though, right? Because you may have this almost like uh, what's your peak workload, what's your worst case scenario, what's your best case scenario. Exactly. Peak, it, the tops number is just peak. What's really important is a question of the effective average utilization over the course of the inference. So let's say I have two engines I'm choosing from. Let's say I'm a silicon vendor, I'm trying to integrate an NPU. One vendor gives me a four tops choice, another gives me a one tops choice. They could actually be equivalent in terms of performance. If the four top engine can only really be fed and, and kept busy 15% of the time, the one top engine is more efficiently balanced and effectively designed and it can run 70, 80% effective utilization. It might actually be higher performing than the so-called four tops implementation. So really what you're trying to find is how do you build the architecture that works for you as opposed to going ac according to the numbers on, at the top line, right? Exactly. And that really is a factor of what else exists in the NPU or the system besides just this simple Mac array. So what else have you drawn here? Okay. So if all we had was just a Mac array and all we could do was load data into inputs, hit it with a clock, get the output, and then flush that back out to system memory. You get this very high peak performance, but you spend most of your time waiting for the rest of the system to feed data in, drain data out. So the effective utilization across the entire length of the inference depends on how well data is buffered in local memory in between uh, computations. Do you reuse computations in layers without flushing everything to memory? Do you have some form of compression that takes weights uh, and intermediate activations from that system memory and keeps it compressed until it gets very close to the max? And do you have a, a smart system for doing the data movement or DMA so that you're hiding the latencies to and from the memory on the system bus or off chip such that this array of multipliers can be kept busy virtually every clock cycle? A very well-designed NPU or ML accelerator can keep the multipliers busy 80, 90% of the time on a sustained basis. Therefore, if you have a a two-top system, you get close to two tops average throughput. A poorly designed or mismatched uh, ML part may say it's two tops or four tops, but if it's only getting 20% throughput, you, you do the math, you realize it's really only you know half of an effective tops on a sustained basis. So we're no longer looking at the individual speed or performance or power of an individual component. What we're looking at is the total system architecture. Exactly. System architecture and whether or not the, the NPU or ML accelerator has been designed and balanced for your type of network. Uh, data rates play a big part in this. If something is speech related, the sampling rates are much lower than if it's uh, still image and still uh, video with high frame rates is even higher level. So making sure you're picking something and getting uh, reference information from the silicon vendor or the IP vendor to tell you under what conditions was this chip or was this uh, piece of IP benchmarked? What was the reference implementation of a network? And how was that network trained? How sparse was it? How much was it pruned? That helps you determine whether or not your particular algorithm looks similar to what was used in those benchmarks. So what happens if you take an existing architecture and put a bunch of Macs in there versus designing completely from the ground up? What's the difference in terms of performance, in terms of power, in terms of throughput? Good, good questions. Um, if you start with the premise that existing architectures, a CPU, a GPU, a DSP, were balanced uh, and uh, had the right balance between uh, compute and throughput for the targets of what they were originally created for, and say, let me repurpose this. Let me take something and shove another 512 max in to boost the peak performance. You wind up with a situation where, yeah, for one or two clock cycles, it delivers the peak performance, but the average throughput uh, is lower. You get an imbalanced machine. If, if the Mac array is, demands much more throughput than the DMA engine can, can hold or the local buffering scheme can handle, you wind up with, you know, it's the, the guy at the gym who only goes once a week and just does arm exercises, uh, neglects legs, and winds up looking like, you know, a, a, a strange Hulk where, where he's imbalanced. He doesn't quite look like he intended to because he didn't put the right effort into to crafting his... Uh, uh, his physique. Same thing here. If you take an existing architecture, pump it up with steroids so that all it has is a whole bunch more max, but it's imbalanced, you're not really going to get the throughput that you're bargaining for, whether it be at the chip level or at the IP level. Steve Roddy, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.